Good morning, all souls. Um, this morning, I'd like to read to you from um, a book that really changed my life. Um, it's Stonebridge Blues by Leslie Feinberg, um, in which she chronicles her process of coming to terms with her lesbian identity in the 60s and 70s and then the 80s. Um, and she writes, during this night, I had a dream. I walked across a vast field. Women and men and children stood on the edges of the field, looking at me, smiling and nodding. I headed towards a small round hut. I had a feeling I had been in this place before. There were people who were different like me inside. We could all see our reflections in the faces of those who sat in this circle. I looked around. It was hard to say who I was as a woman. Was I a man? Their faces radiated a different kind of beauty than what I'd grown up seeing celebrated on television or magazines. It's a beauty one isn't born with, but one must fight to construct at great price. I felt proud to sit among them. I was proud to be one of them. A fire burned in the center of our gathering. One of the oldest in the circle caught my eyes. I didn't know if she was a man or a woman at birth. I held up, she held up an object. I understood I was supposed to accept the realness of this object. I looked more closely. I nodded, acknowledging the shadow was real as the ring that she she held up. She smiled and waved her hand in the space between the ring and the shadow. Isn't this distance also real? And then she indicated our circle. I felt my whole life coming full circle, growing up so different, coming out as a butch lesbian, passing as a man, and then back to the same question that had shaped my entire existence, woman or man? This morning, I'd like to invite us all into that circle that Leslie Feinberg talks about, the circle of stories told around a fire. Good morning. Welcome to our virtual All Souls Indie Gathering. I am Diane Kennedy. All Souls is an inclusive congregation where we do our best to live the elements of our covenant. We celebrate the inherent worth and dignity of ourselves, each other, all people, and all living things. We put love in action by forming community, helping those less fortunate, and working to aid the environment. Today, Nazreen Khan will help us celebrate May Day with the consideration of how we sow seeds. In this case, the seeds of community. May Day has been celebrated for centuries as a time of planting and growth. And what we sow, so may we reap. From seeds of community, we can reach the, reap the richness of connectedness. Like all other soul, all soul services, we can bring our whole selves to this one. All Souls is a place where we can re reconnect with our values and with a support system of community. We will have virtual connection cards available later in the service. There's chatting available during the service and a virtual coffee hour afterwards. Now, please be patient with me as I light our chalice and then we recite our covenant. Love is the spirit of this church, and service is its law. To dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. This is our covenant. Source of all to thee. 
Hello again. I am in a time of transition. Last month, my son and his family moved into their own home, taking an adult male, an adult female, two girls, three cats, and a dog. For the first time since 1974, I am living alone, except for one cat. I'm letting the dust settle before deciding what, if anything, I am going to do about my housing situation and about my career. I no longer need a four bedroom, two story plus basement house, house, and I have passed the social security for retirement age, but I'm also not in a hurry to make decisions. As a result of my situation, I may be a little more attuned to the meaning of community. After reading a book about the effect of retirement in removing communities of coworkers and of clients, customers, patients, whoever you served while you were working. It occurred to me that all souls and other churches may tend to be populated by older folks because they are communities and we all need community. We need connectedness. Nazarene suggested that I consider what seeds of connection I have planted and what fruit they have yielded. Gardens must be tended. To avoid social isolation, I make it a point to have at least one social connection every day, whether it's meeting a friend for lunch or taking a walk with someone, sending an I thinking about, I'm thinking about you email or calling a relative. It goes on my daily to-do list and gets done. What is the fruit? It is a social community of people who stimulate me, care for me, and make me happy. I hope I do the same for them. At All Souls, I am an active member of the congregation. For me, attending Sunday service is not enough. By Sunday, I'm Zoomed out and generally don't attend the coffee hour. But I do help with distributing children's materials, acting as worship associate, tending the butterfly garden, participating in small groups, going on member hikes and the like. I have developed wonderful friendships and found people I can depend on. Those things are here for you as well. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. For those who may not know me, my name is Sarah Cannon and I'm our Director of Children's and Community Programming here at All Souls. And I'm so excited because it is Beltane weekend. This is one of my favorites of the neo-pagan Sabbaths that are sometimes referred to as the wheel of the year. Beltane is a celebration of new life. Now, those of you who have been paying attention might be asking yourselves, wait, didn't we do that already back in February when we talked about Imbolc? And didn't we talk about it again about a month ago for Ostara? Mm, yes and no. You see, Imbolc is a holiday about the first stirring of hope. The baby lambs begin to be born, which is one of the earliest signs of spring. And we think to ourselves, we might just get through this. And Ostara is one step further. There are eggs to eat. The baby bunnies are being born. The earliest green shoots and flowers are coming up. But as some of you might have noticed, even after Ostara, there can be snow. It can damage important things, like the blossoms on our fruit trees, for example. No blossoms, no fruit. In fact, even though I threw sheets over my grapevines to protect them during the snow, I'm pretty sure my family won't be harvesting any grapes this year, which is disappointing for us, but it could be a huge problem for a farmer if fruit is their major crop. So even after Ostara, farmers and gardeners have to hold their breath. But Beltane? Beltane is the holiday that says we made it. We got through another winter. We're still here. 
the earth is laughing in flowers and the ground is warm and we can plant next winter's food with hope in our hearts. We get kind of disconnected from that feeling nowadays, don't we? We might be excited to see strawberries on sale in the grocery store, but harvesting strawberries yourself is different. There's a little pop you can hear when you pick a perfectly ripe strawberry from a field or a garden. Ripe, sun-warmed fruit smells 10 times as good as fruit at the grocery store. And in a garden, the birds are singing and butterflies come to visit you. Getting my food from a garden often feels like praying to me in a way that going to the grocery store does not. That's why I'm so excited about our community garden. We are starting it today, but if you can't come this time, don't worry. That's the thing about gardens. There is always something new to do or see. And I'm very excited about some of the things we could plant. For example, have you ever grown a house made of flowers? Seen a pizza garden? picked a purple green bean? We could do all of those things this summer and gardening is very good for our souls. For example, have you ever eaten food you grew yourself? Fed someone else food you grew? Grown something you just plain can't find at the store? It feels so good to do these things. I can't wait to include our community garden in our spiritual practices here at All Souls and celebrate the spirit of Beltane today as we break ground together. Thank you. Good morning, all souls. Um, this morning, I have a particular joy as well as the ongoing sorrow um, that we mentioned last week. Um, we stand with our Sikh brothers and sisters this morning as we um, grieve with them for the shootings at FedEx last um, a few weeks ago. Yesterday, the Sikh community held a vigil. Um, for their brothers and sisters who were lost in this shooting. And we particularly keep them in our hearts today. And another joy that I know particularly affects many people I know personally, um, it feels as if new hope is coming. Very soon there will be um, childcare assistance for people who are paying for um, childcare for ages six and under. And I know for so many single mothers like myself, in this congregation and in our wider local and national community. This is such a joy that perhaps we as a community, as a country, as a nation, and as a world are beginning to value our children as really the way of the future. Thank you. This morning for the prayer and meditation, um, I'd like to read to you a poem that touched me deeply as a young child um, and continues to touch me today. Um, and it's entitled The Courage That My Mother Had by Edna St. Vincent Millay. I'm sure so many of you are familiar with it. The courage that my mother had went with her and is with her still. Rock from New England quarried, now granite in a granite hill. The golden brooch my mother wore, she left behind for me to wear. I have no thing I treasure more, yet it is something I could spare. Oh, if she'd left to me instead, the thing that she took to the grave, the courage like a rock, which she has no more need of, and I have. This morning, we speak about courage, we speak about rocks, we speak about mothers, and I invite you to Focus in on yourselves, on your ancestors, on your family, 
and delve deeply into the gifts of our own heritage. to call attention to the Soul Matters theme of the week or theme of the month, which is story. Last month's theme was becoming. And this month we focus on the idea of story. Um, and usually when I speak or read or perform, um, sometimes friends make fun of me because of how uh, meticulous I am about my notes and writing everything out down to the last detail. But today, it's a lot less formal. I'm sitting in my dining room, having a cup of coffee, surrounded by the remains of uh, <laughs> last night's dinner that you can't see off screen. And I'd like to tell you some stories. The first is a difficult story, and the second is kind of a silly story. My earliest memory in life is being three years old in a Senegalese jail. And I was screaming, screaming for my father who was being housed in a different jail cell than my mother and I. We had just arrived from Indonesia where they had lived for a year as teachers and they were on their way to becoming teachers in Senegal, West Africa. My parents were very deeply religious Christians Christians. And at the time, Senegal still gave missionary visas, which is to say you were religious workers coming to do evangelical or humanitarian work. My father is from Afghanistan. However, when he was 16, he converted to Christianity and was ostracized by his family. And so he immigrated to Pakistan which at the time was a much more liberal country than Afghanistan. 
He also attended a British boarding school. And because he was he had been in boarding school, he had good connections that helped him get a British citizenship. So fast forward all these years later, and he's married to my Chinese Filipino mother. Um, and they are sort of political nomads wandering the earth because my mother, who is Chinese and Filipino, uh, is not allowed to enter Afghanistan because of that political situation. So here they are, my parents, my father speaks eight languages, my mom speaks six. They have no language in common except for English and we are in a Senegalese jail. Why are we in a Senegalese jail? because my father is from Afghanistan here on a Christian missionary visa and yet somehow carrying a dual citizenship with Britain, Britain and Pakistan. Even to the untrained eye, this looks suspicious. Since when did the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan start sending Christian missionaries to Africa? Since never is the answer to that. Um, and so I was terrified. I didn't understand what was happening. I didn't understand the concept of deportation or political instability. What I did understand was that my mother and I were free to go. However, we could not go to Senegal where we were meant to go because we were women and our visas were tied to the man protecting us, which was my father. And if he was not allowed to come, neither were we. It had a fairly easy ending. My father's American employers came to the jail. They greased some palms. They had some conversations. They drank some endless cups of sweet tea. And the next morning we were released and taken to our accommodations on the campus that my parents would be teaching. We lived in Senegal until I was nine. When I was nine, 9-11 nine happened. And all of my parents' colleagues were taken, deep, not taken, but um, evacuated out of Senegal because they had embassies that were taking care of their nationals. However, my parents' two embassies were still at war with each other and would not evacuate a multiracial family with two different political um, homes. And so it was my family and a Brazilian family who were left on the campus. And I don't remember this as a scary time, but I'm sure my parents remember it as a terrifying time. We had rations of food that were mostly taken by the Senegalese army that was guarding us. What I remember best is that the army soldiers used to teach me how to clean their guns and then they would make these necklaces and trinkets out of the spent cartridges. It was a fun time, the clinking of the metal, having people around around being the only child that everyone doted on. But I do remember my mother cried every day. The second story I'd like to tell you involves my mother-in-law. My mother-in-law, Peg Clark, <laughs> is a German Catholic woman who lives in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. She raised four kids mostly by herself because her husband ran the ambulance service in town and also was the uh, mortician for the town. And so he worked constantly. And she tells stories of lashing her four children um, to, the, to the clothesline on a, on a link that would go back and forth on the clothesline so that they could run back and forth in the backyard without having to worry about where they were going off. After all, she had diapers to wash, cakes to bake, phones to answer for the business. She's a really remarkable woman. <laughs> my husband, uh, my ex-husband is 30 years older than me. And when he brought me home to meet her, I was 19 and she didn't bat an eyelash. Um, all she did was say, here's your room. Would you like some cookies? <clears throat> no judgment. 
So years after I'd had my child, she was cleaning out her garage. And she said, oh, I think there's some wedding china from my great grandmother. And she said, I don't know if anyone wants it, but whoever wants it can take it or else I'm just gonna throw it out. And I was aghast. I was a young bride in the 2000s where nobody has wedding china anymore. And I said, I want it. I want that wedding china. And she said, oh, fine, go get it. And so I went and I found the box labeled great grandmother's wedding china. And I opened it up with great anticipation and it was empty. There was nothing in the box, not even a silver fork. And I said, Peg, it's empty. And she said, oh yeah, I threw it out last year. I totally forgot that I had thrown it out. It was so old, who would want it anyway? And I said, I wanted it. <laughs> and she said, okay, well, if I find some around, I'll let you have it. But there was something at play there that was very different. My mother-in-law's house is decorated with quilts that her mother had made, carvings that her father had made, furniture that her great grandparents had had and accumulated. The, the yellow rocking chair that sits in my living room now was the, the rocking chair she nursed her four babies in and the rocking chair that her mother had nursed babies in. I had nothing like that. We moved around so much. We moved in the, in the dark of night, in the middle of political instability, in the middle of war, in the middle of nothing at all, that my parents always kept a go bag by the door with passports from our various countries, cash, both in US currency, Senegalese, currency, Indonesian currency, and Euro as well, just in case. My mother had coats with family jewels sewn into the bottom like we were Russian Anastasia um, royalty escaping from our very not royal positions. I didn't have rocking chairs and wedding china and silver and furniture. I didn't have any of that. Perhaps the only thing that survives from my childhood is this tapestry that hangs behind me. This was a gift from the Senegalese staff when we left Senegal. So I tell you these stories as a way of asking, what do stories do for us? This is our Soul Matters theme for the month. What do stories do for us? Why do we tell stories? Do they have value? We live in a world where everything is on a screen. I have Netflix, Hulu, HBO, YouTube. I mean, I don't pay for any of them, but I have like other people's passwords to them. Um, and all of these are collections of stories, TV shows. I have a myriad of books. So what do stories do for us? They provide particularly to people like me without rootedness, without antiques and family ancestry that we can point to. They provide us a link to the past and a way to teach our, our children about the future. There's a lot of rootedness in this immigrant community I see around me. I live in Hawville. It's primarily black and Latinx. And these people, my neighbors, I hear their stories of crossing the desert in the middle of the night, of, of being thirsty for months at a time because they're all they are able to drink is a cup of water a day, rationing it while they cross the border. Of fleeing war, of leaving family members behind, of having fathers and uncles deported and I see their reaction to that unrootedness. All around me, every house is painted bright salmon or bright blue or flaming green. Every house has chicken coops and gardens and spare parts of, for cars 
and wood shops in the back planning for projects. Because the immigrant community I live in has much to teach me about staying rooted, about harvesting from the roots, about coming together around a fire and saying, let us tell our stories because this is the way we begin to plant some roots for the harvest. All of these projects they plan our hope for the future, our hope that despite the threat of deportation, despite the threat of scarcity and poverty, there is hope for the future. Much the same way that the holiday of Beltane celebrates fertility. I celebrate the immigrant communities in this country and many others who say against all odds, we dare, we dare to put down roots. We dare to tell our stories to our children and we dare to continue the story our parents told us. Another story I'd like to tell you comes from literature. I have so many books, so many in my collection. They're titled Longing, Lust and Love, Black Lesbian Stories, Stone Butch Blues by Leslie Feinberg, The Sexual Persona by Camille Paglia, The Feminine Face of God, Drag King Dreams, and many others. For me, growing up in a Muslim country as a queer woman, I had no one to teach me <laughs> what that meant. I had no one to tell me that there had been a queer movement in the West long before I was born, that people were, were working to change laws. All I knew was that it meant danger. And so I read everything I could get my hands on. Leslie Feinberg, others like her, gay poets and writers, they became the queer ancestors that I never had. They provided the rootedness and the family that I couldn't find. I didn't know anyone who was openly gay for a long time. I think the lesson here is that whether you're an immigrant, whether you're far from your family, whether you're a queer person or whether you just feel othered and left out of the story, that there is a way to harvest from the roots. There is a way to reach behind ourselves and say, I will tap into this root. I will become part of this rootedness. And then also a way to move forward. This Beltane, this spring, this upcoming church year, let us tell our stories. Let us tell our stories to each other. Let them take root. Let those seeds be watered and nurtured. And let us receive those seeds, those seeds that are handed to us. Let us receive them with gratitude, reassuring each other that the gifts that we give, the stories we tell, will be treasured and cared for. Happy Beltane. Peace be with you. Thank you, Nazreen. It occurred to me as she was speaking that she and I could not possibly be more different. My son has traced our roots back to the, he says, second boat after the Mayflower. And, you know, I am straight and had two boys and am old. It just shows how different people can come together in meaningful ways. And that's what we do at All Souls, I think. Each week, All Souls shares one half of the cash or specifically earmarked donations with an organization that shares our values. This week, we are sharing with No, Mar no Mas Borges. I hope I didn't butcher that too bad. It is a humanitarian organization that works 
to aid people at the southern border. All Souls partnership with other organizations to work for social and economic justice is one way we put love in action. Your contribution help our efforts to put love in action. As time goes by, I have found the more I give, the more I get. I hope you have discovered the truth of this maxim as well and will give generously this morning. We will now take time for this week's offering. Good morning again. For the benediction today, I'd like to tell you one last story. <laughs> this little heart is made out of marble. It was given to me a long time ago by an older man in a bar, I don't even know where. He had carved it after his wife had left him. He was a stonemason and he showed it to me and said, I like to carve little things out of stone. And he looked at me and he said, you wanna keep it, don't you? And I said, no, it's yours. Then he gave it to me and said, no, you can keep it. And I saw what he was struggling with. He was thinking, this means a lot to me. Will this strange girl in a bar that I've never seen before, probably will never see again, treasure this piece of marble appropriately? The answer is yes, I do treasure it appropriately. I treasure it because it's the symbol of what we do for each other as humans, whether we're strangers in a bar or committed parts of the same faith community. It is that the giving of a story, the receiving of a story and the treasuring of that story. It's the care we show to one another when we are vulnerable and trust that that vulnerability will be softly cradled by the receiver. So as we go out into the world today, tell each other your stories, tell each other the difficult stories, the happy, joyful stories, the funny stories, the boring stories, be vulnerable to one another. And most importantly, Listen to one another, hear each other, hear each other in this community, 
and hear each other out in the world. May you tell your stories and listen to others' stories and tap into the root of what it means to harvest this season. Thank you.